Hi there, and welcome to Bike File with me, Wazza. This week on the show, Louise will be doing this, Rod will be doing this, and in the meantime, I'm here at Bruntingthorpe Proving Ground with the fastest production motorcycle in the world. Welcome the Suzuki Hayabusa. So here we have it, the fastest motorcycle you can buy, full stop. The Suzuki GSX 1300R Hayabusa, the only production motorcycle to ever hit a genuine 200 mile an hour, right here at Bruntingthorpe Proving Ground on the runway just over there. Put simply, this motorcycle is brutally fast. It has a civilized side, but who really cares about civilized? That is not why you buy one of these. You buy it because it will turn your internal organs inside out. It pulls the horizon towards you, sucks it up, spits it out behind you before you've even had time to blink. It will destroy your driving license if you don't have some sense of self-control and it makes women's clothes fall off. Look at Tina up there. Fully dressed when we arrived, since we parked up, now down to a Basque. Who knows what she's gonna be in by the end of the show. The key to the Hayabusa is this motor here. Nothing particularly staggering, it's a 1300cc inline four cylinder motor. But that is only telling half the story because at the back wheel, this equates to a genuine 154 bhp as it comes out of the crate and get this 94 foot pound of torque there really is no substitute for cubes on a good day a genuine 200 mile an hour is what you will get from this kawasaki zx12 may actually have two horsepower more but it's the torque figure that sees the suzuki romping home powering through the air quicker than anything else you can care to mention but then who cares what the spec sheet really says? That's immaterial if the bike's not exciting to ride. However, the feeling from the rider's perch on this motorcycle is unique. The motor and the force and the power that it generates to punch you forwards is absolutely mind bending. There's bottom end, there's mid range, there's top end. There is a vast wall of power. Anywhere you care to mention, you can be in top gear, crack the throttle, you've got power. If you really want to get a move on, drop a couple of cogs, get it wound up. The speedo just spins itself around like a demon, the revs go up, and anything that was traveling with you is very soon a long way behind. You've just got to try it at least once in your life, please. But there is a civilized side to the higher booster as well, because with this much power and torque on tap, you've got a very, very flexible motor. It'll pull top gear from as low as 20 miles an hour. So potting around town, this bike will do it nice and easy. Everything you like in top gear, you can change gear if you want to, but to be honest, you can be very lazy, stick it in autopilot and off it goes. But that's only half the story. If you've got one of these, please do use it. I found myself on this very bike here in the middle of France, needing to get back to a ferry in a hurry. Get your head down, spin this thing up and go absolutely ballistic because it's an experience not to be missed. Now it's over to Louise, who's on the Sax XTC. Well, as we all know, the world's becoming a busier place and our cities are getting more populated. Our roads are becoming more congested and chargers are coming into force. It's just not on, is it? So more and more people are turning to two wheels instead of four. Well, the problem is a lot of those people who don't know about bikes are put off by the size of a motorbike the weight, the power and the insurance costs. A scooter isn't an option for some men as it wouldn't look cool down the pub and it wouldn't do their street cred an awful lot of good. But what a lot of those non-bikers don't realise is there is an option like this one, the Sax 125 XTC. It looks a lot of bike, but at the heart of this is a little tiny 125 engine. In spring 2002, German motorcycle manufacturer Sachs revealed their new four-stroke single-cylinder version of the rather good-looking sporty 125. Now the Sachs styling is based on the earlier two-stroke version, but this new 2002 model looks far more stylish and classy and really has a lot of character about it. It's only available in gleaming black and you would be the envy of all your friends. 
if this was parked outside the youth club. Now the beauty of this bike certainly lies in its looks. It has a very smart and trendy underseat exhaust system and a trellis frame that any Ducati would be proud of. At the centre of this mean looking machine you'll find a high revving Suzuki 125 four stroke engine which really likes to be taken to the max. Well as far as you can with 15 brake horsepower. The best thing you can do with this bike is add a big bore kit to give it a bit more mouth and trousers. But take this bike for a spin and as on the previous model you'll find the handling is superb and glides around corners easily. Out on the open roads it switches from side to side with ease and with an all-up weight of only 130 kilograms and brake discs front and back there's certainly no problem in the stopping department. So let's take a look at the scores on the doors and start with performance. Well, you see the problem is that this looks a lot of bike and when you're at the traffic light, the rally boys next door are going to want to race you. Problem is, you might beat them for the first two seconds off the line, but then they're going to leave you for dust, I'm afraid. This small 125 engine is only going to give it 7 out of 10. OK, let's look at value for money. The brand new Saks XTC 125, you're going to be looking at around £3,500. Now it is cheaper than the Aprilia RS125, which gives it the thumbs up. But the problem is that this bike is really aimed for younger riders. Maybe riders who haven't as yet passed their test. And not very many of them have that kind of money to throw about. So in my opinion, it deserves 7 out of 10. So let's move on to build quality. Well, I reckon this bike deserves 8 out of 10 because on closer inspection, it seems to be put together pretty well. Then again, it's German, isn't it? And they certainly know how to hammer something together. And as for street cred, well, I think it deserves 9 out of 10. That'll certainly be from all the teeny boppers, all the boys and girls down at the school disco and all the Valentino Rossi wannabes. But when it comes to that Sunday morning burnout, you can't really mix it with the big boys now, can you? And as for the comfort, well, it's only going to score 4 out of 10 as far as I'm concerned. The padding on this seat is paper thin and you'd feel every little hump and bump. The tank seems a bit obtrusive as well because it's a bit of a reach to the handlebars and the bike has got that dreaded spring-loaded side stand. Welcome back to Bruntingthorpe Proving Ground on this dismally cold and misty day with this, the Suzuki Hayabusa. Now, as we already know, this is the fastest motorcycle that money can buy. But I have a sneaking suspicion that the people at Suzuki are sitting on their laurels a little bit with this bike because it's starting to show its age. When this bike was launched four years ago, these six pot calipers up the front here were regarded as being very good brakes indeed. And to be fair, they're not bad, but time and tide wait for no man and no motorcycle. And nowadays, they're a little bit long in the tooth. They'll stop the bike, but they do feel a bit crude. The power's there, there's not a great deal of feel to be had. Really, they need to be better, otherwise this bike is gonna start to feel very dated. And this slightly crude feel with the Hayabusa extends to the handling as well. Now when the bike was launched, everyone was very impressed that something this big and this fast could also handle as well as the Hayabusa does. And to be fair, it's very stable, it's very accurate, it doesn't turn around and bite you or anything like that, but it is quite lardy. So if you're hustling it hard down a back road, not only is it going to be quite knackering because it's such a big old thing to chuck about, but you've also got to be very deliberate and accurate with what you do. So there's no howling up to a corner on the brakes, slamming the bike in and changing your line halfway around because you didn't quite get it right. The bike won't play ball. You've got to get to the corner right, get it settled into the turn and then use the power to gas you out because once you're committed on the line with this, you are committed, that's it. And if you take it to the track, not the bike's natural habitat, but it will do it. If you do take it to the track, you will find that the ground clearance is quite limited. First thing you know, pegs will be going down, swiftly followed by the exhaust, then the belly pan, after which point it's you, because you're off. So, take care. Well, that's all we've got time for in part one. Please do join us again in part two. But in the meantime, I'm off to get a cup of tea because I'm absolutely freezing. Welcome back to part two. 
with a slightly cleaner Hayabusa. Now, when we collected this thing, it was actually in showroom condition, fresh out of a showroom, in fact. But after just half an hour going up and down Bruntingthorpe, the thing looked like it had spent a month at the bottom of the local canal. But with some handy glass cleaner and a rag, it's all back to shininess again. Getting back to day-to-day -day practicalities with the Hayabusa, how easy is this bike to live with? Well, actually, very. Despite its size and bulk, once you've got it moving, it's a very stable, balanced motorbike, so filtering through traffic really isn't the problem you might think it could be. As well as this, you've got a lot of room in this riding position. It is a bit of a stretch to the bars, so shorties may find the bike a little too long, but average to normal height people, not a problem. And if you want to take a pillion, a very good pillion seat with a proper, traditional rear grab rail. Why people have started putting on side grab rails these days, I don't know. Something like this works better than anything, and this seat is very, very palatial. One thing that isn't so smart, however, is that screen. Aerodynamics on this bike might be excellent, but the screen is simply too low. On the one hand, when you sat on the bike, it cuts out half your view of the clocks, because all you see is the edge of it here. And on the other hand, when you're getting a move on, it's simply not enough for you to be able to tuck down behind and you still cop a lot of wind blast on the top of your head even when you're tucked in, which just leads to a sore neck. So, there you go. One thing that is worth bearing in mind if you're thinking of getting yourself a Hayabusa is they are not very cheap motorcycles to run. Now initially when the bike was launched there were shock horror reports in the press of how you were only going to get 500 miles to a back tyre. Now really, unless you're doing burnouts everywhere, this isn't the case. Energetic use, expect to see 2,000 miles out of one, and if you're pottering around, well, they'll last for ages. Something else that's going to cost you a bit of money is petrol. Get angry with the loud handle, use this bike the way it wants to be used, and you're going to see the fuel light coming on within 70 miles. Very, very impressive, and very, very expensive. Potter around, however, 150, 200 miles out of a tank, ain't a bother. Also, insurance ain't going to be the cheapest. It's the fastest motorbike in the world, therefore it attracts a fair old insurance premium. But as most Hayabusa owners seem to be over 45, perhaps this isn't such a problem. So as you can see, the Hayabusa is a complex beast. It's a blend of explosive straight line performance, built in with competent handling, a slightly too low screen, a rather comfortable riding position, and a very, very thirsty motor. But the one thing that stands out on this bike is the feeling it gives you. The sheer experience of the way this motorcycle will catapult you into the sunset is something that everyone should try before they die. Beg, borrow, steal, sell your granny, do what you have to, but just make sure that one day in your life you ride a Suzuki Hayabusa. Because I really can't see there being a faster motorcycle made in the foreseeable future. But if you do want one, you're going to have to work very hard. You see, they were never brought into the country in massive numbers, and people who've got them are very keen to keep hold of them, simply because of the bike's iconic status. And if they come into dealers, because plenty of people do want to get hold of them, they don't tend to hang around for very long. So you're going to need to get looking hard. But believe me, it will be worth it. And now, from Hayabusa's to Hell's Angels, it's Rod interviewing Sonny Barger. If Harley Davidson didn't exist, if there, if there was, was no such thing as a Harley, what, what other bike would you choose to ride? Oh, like I've said before, if, you know, if I didn't ride a Harley, I'd probably ride a BMW or a Right, and you'd be happy riding a, one of those? Probably a lot happier than I am with the Harley, but I'm stuck with the Harley because I'm a Hells Angel. Have Harley Davidson Motor Company asked you to join in their centenary celebrations next year? Harley Davidson would rather I didn't even ride their motorcycle. Really? Let alone come to one of their monuments. Uh, but as, as such a famous figure, you must have brought some great publicity for the brand. Well, I think the thing of it is the infamous, not famous. Famous guys like Harlan Ness and them, who, uh, you know, they, they became so famous in the building and such of aftermarket Harley Davidson motorcycles that Harley has to accept them. Hmm. But they don't want to accept my lifestyle at all. 
They want to make money off of it, but they don't want to admit they're part of it. Um, your latest book, the, um, this, this, the Riding High Living Free book, which, which is, uh, that's what's really brought you to the UK, am I right? This is, this is yes. now? And this is a, a collection of, um, of some wild real life biking stories. I've, I've read the book and enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, some of the stories uh, obviously concern you and, and friends of yours, but lots of the stories... The majority of them are stories yeah. about the average guy riding a motorcycle out of the life, say Steve McQueen's in there and David Crosby. Right. They're basically just about people that ride motorcycles and what happened to them, and they usually sit in bars at night and say, hey, this is what happened. And what we did is we went on the internet and said if anybody had any interesting stories, tell them to me they did. And we picked some of them and wrote them and put them in the book. What a beautiful day for riding a bike. Not a storm cloud in the sky. If, like me, you're a fan of big trail bikes, you're going to like this. Because big trail bikes just got bigger, badder and meaner. This is the V-Strom. Suzuki's DL1000 V-Strom is the latest entrant into the increasingly competitive big trailer market and as such goes head to head with established market leaders like BMW's R1150GS and Triumph's Tiger as well as younger pretenders including the Honda Varadero and Aprilia Caponode. Suzuki have got one up on the lot of them by picking the weirdest name yet to come from a Japanese marketing department. V-Strom sounds to me rather like a typing error and conjures up images of the marketing department having to change the model name when they realise the wrong fairing graphics have been delivered. I'm told by a Norwegian friend that Strom actually means power. Let's see if he's right. This is a 207 kilogram trail bike that's well capable of giving many a sports bike a good run for its money while still behaving like a pussycat in traffic. The frame and cycle parts are well up to the job. This massive alloy twin beam frame holding everything together really securely. We've got a conventional alloy swinging arm at the back and right way up forks at the front. Twin pot nissing calipers at the front and a single one at the rear pull everything down from speed. The tyres say trail wing on them in a nod to the bike's off-road pretensions, but I don't think these are ever going to see anything more than tarmac. Suzuki have had no qualms about going for the jugular in the styling department and the bike's aggressive stance is highlighted by the predatory looking headlamps and beefy twin silencers that look capable of launching motors at following traffic. On the road the bike feels surprisingly manageable and can be hurled around like something half its weight and capacity. It's reassuring, forgiving and comfortable and the high riding position lets you exchange nods with lorry drivers whilst looking disdainfully down at the swarms of Mondeos beneath you. The vertically challenged may need to enlist the services of a small stepladder to climb aboard, but once you're up there, you won't want to get off. A good practical all-rounder and great fun. It won't quite eat fireblades for breakfast, but it has more than enough power for most of us. Power delivery is strong and a smooth torque curve makes the bike easy to handle in traffic. The chassis and brakes are well up to the job and the bike feels safe and forgiving to ride. For performance, 8 out of 10. This big tall riding position may not suit everybody, but it rivals my favourite armchair for comfort with great vision all around. The fairing is surprisingly effective at speed too, keeping the worst of the wind blast away from all the rider apart from maybe a little bit to your head and shoulders. For comfort, I've got to give this bike 9 out of 10. Some of the fasteners in the disc centres may begin to rust fairly quickly if neglected, and some of the plastics are a bit, well, plasticky. The paint finish is good, and those stainless exhausts should last almost into the next millennium. For build quality, 6 out of 10. So what do you get for your money? At £7,350 on the road, the V-Strom's pretty good value, managing to undercut both the Triumph Tiger, the BMW GS and the Varadero. But watch out for the Yamaha TDM 900 galloping up on the inside at just a few pounds cheaper. I think the V-Strom gives you a lot of bike for your money, but you must be prepared for some depreciation. The value, I give this bike 7 out of 10. It's a big, mean and tough looking bike that looks like it could crush the opposition with a glance. Only the misspelled fairing graphics mar the image slightly. 
If Suzuki rebadged it as a V-Storm, I'd have to give it 8. But for the time being, 7 out of 10 for street cred. And now we're back with the Suzuki Hayabusa where it's conclusion time, starting with performance. Now if we were just talking about that motor, it's got to be a 10 out of 10. This thing pulls like a train. However, there's handling and braking to be taken into the equation as well, and I'm going to knock a couple of points off. The brakes aren't really good enough anymore, although they do do the job, and the handling really could do with being a little sharper against competition like the ZX-12, although it is fairly accurate. Build quality. 7 out of 10. She's a big, heavy, fast motorcycle. And like Kawasaki's old ZZR 1100, she doesn't wear that well unless you look after her. Basically, things like the cush drive, the head bearings, they do get a bit of a workout. The exhaust can go a bit rusty as well. So, if you've got one of these, you need to give it a little bit of spit and polish every now and again. Keep it in top nick. Value for money. 10 out of 10. This much speed for eight and a half grand new, you're having a laugh. I know it's a little bit expensive to run, but then extreme speed is a costly hobby. Street cred, bit of a mixed bag this. To those in the know, you're riding the fastest motorcycle money can buy, therefore it's a 10. To those not in the know, you're riding a very ugly motorcycle, in which case it's a zero. So I think we're gonna go with a five. Comfort, riding position's very roomy, seats are very comfortable, only let down by that screen that's too low. Seven out of 10. Right, well that's it for this episode of Bike Files, so hope you've enjoyed it. All that's left now is for me to do this.